BrethrenNews.com presents. Good morning. Um, hi, my name is Joanne Matthews. Thank you, Auntie, for that warm introduction. Um, um, as Auntie said, my name is Joanne. I'm from Chicago originally, um, but last year I moved to St. Louis, Missouri. In Chicago, I'm in fellowship with the Saints at the New Life Bible Chapel, and in Missouri, I'm in fellowship with the Saints at the Maplewood Bible Chapel. I thank the Lord for the opportunity to share my testimony today. Um, I'm not a speaker by any means, so I just request your prayers, even as I stand here, that above all else, God's name be glorified. My testimony tonight, um, it's a simple one. I am a PK. For those of you who may know what that is, it stands for a pastor's kid or an elder's kid. Um, as such, my brothers and I, we had a very unique experience growing up. Um, oftentimes, people would come to my parents and they'd, you know, they'd present their, just their, explain the difficulties and the challenges that they were going through. And as kids and as a family, we would pray for that individual, for those people. And oftentimes, we just get to see the power of prayer. Also growing up, uh, whenever evangelists or ministers would come to our church to preach, they would stay at our house. Um, and at prayer time, or even over Opma and Payam in the morning at breakfast, we would get to hear these amazing stories of how they would hold Bible study in secret, or how they were put into prison, or just the various ways they were persecuted for doing the Lord's work in India, in China, Nepal, or Guatemala. It was hearing these stories again and again that made me realize, as a child, how real God is and that true faith in him went beyond just a Sunday morning experience. Another thing that really molded my faith with God was just watching the lives of my parents. I was three years old when my parents were called into a life of full-time missions. Um, they left their comfortable jobs in Bahrain and they came to the States um, so that dad could attend Bible college here. And at the time of when they came over, they, you know, in God's divine plan, they actually lost their entire life savings. They were in a foreign country and they had three children to raise. For 13 years, my parents were involved in full-time ministry and were living by faith. It was definitely humble beginnings. Um, but looking back, I thank God for those experiences, for those times that we faced as a family. James chapter one, verse two through four is so true when it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When I watched my, when I watched my parents as a child, I saw two people that were fully committed to doing the Lord's work, and full, two people that were very committed to him and knowing that he would provide our needs. I would come down in the morning and you know, I'd see both of them on the living room floor just praying for me and my brothers and just for the various matters regarding the church. You know, I, I watch and I see my mom, the way she sits at the kitchen table with a coffee at one hand and the Bible opened out in front of her. I see the way that my dad will stand proclaiming the word of God on the streets of Chicago. I watch my mom, the way she embraces the young girls in our church, though especially the ones whose moms are in another state or in another country and just the way that she disciples and that she loves them. I see my dad at the age of 58 and with more enthusiasm and energy than I have at the age of 27, the way he takes students from America and he takes them to India and he just kind of shows them the different ministry work that's going on there with the hope that one day they'd be inspired to do the same. As children, we watch our parents, we watch their reactions to the blessings in life as well as to the difficulties and the trials in our life. It is what we see as kids that impact us, and oftentimes what we emulate. So to the aunties and the moms and the amachis here, I humbly say, just know that your children are watching you. We watch the words you say, we watch the things you do, we watch your relationship with God, and we get to see the result of that relationship. The greatest influence you can have on your daughter's life, outside of praying for her, is visibly living the godly life you would want her to lead and letting her see the resulting power and presence of God in doing so. So with those humble beginnings, I grew up. Um, as I grew up, uh, it was my desire to go to medical school and God in all his mercy and his grace, he granted that, he allowed that. 
Um, those were four very hard years. Um, I think it was during that time that I really learned the power of fervent prayer, whether mine, my family's, or my church family's. You know, I learned that not to be anxious about anything, which for a type A personality is very hard to do, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, I learned to present my request to God, and as a result, I can testify to the peace of God which transcends all understanding that guarded my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Even in terms of getting into residency, it was purely by the grace of God. You know, generally speaking, once you finish medical school, you take your licensing exams, and when you finish that, um, you know, it's just a relief just to pass and get your degree. Um, for certain fields, though, they look at your scores on how you did on these exams, and, you know, for this field that I wanted, I didn't have the scores. I didn't have the years of research or the array of publications that so many of my colleagues did. All I could do was just come before God and just submit it to Him um, and just let Him know my heart's desire. And I'm already tearing up because I know the verse that God gave to me at that time. It was from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, My grace is sufficient for you, for in your weakness my strength is perfected. It's a very humbling thing when God gives you the desires of your heart, when you know that you don't deserve it or that you haven't earned it by your own means. That's what grace means, and I'm so thankful to my Heavenly Father for that grace. Um, so continuing on, I, after graduating from medical school, I started residency, and first year of residency is intern year. It's the hardest year of residency where you're finally making the decisions and taking care of patients, um, and it's hard, but you know, again, I thank God for the needed grace in my, and wisdom to do that. For the second year of residency, I actually moved to St. Louis, Missouri to continue. Um, and it was at that time that, you know, I was really, I came to God again just with a lot of questions regarding my personal and professional life. And I really dove into the Word and I asked, you know, God, show me what your will is in my life. Reveal to me what you want me to do um, in terms of these particular aspects. You know, and God gave me an answer, but it wasn't the answer that I was expecting. He brought me to Luke chapter 12, verse 48, which reads, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. You know, when I came across that verse, it was God telling me, enough. Enough with what you want. Enough with what you, what you need now. Now focus on what I want. I realized at that time just how much God had done for me and how much I hadn't done for Him. It was more than just going to church and trying to live an upright life or listening to my parents. It really came down to a question of where have I sacrificed for the Lord? Where have I said, God, you first, what do you want me to do? And so again, I looked to the word and I came to James chapter 1 verse 27, which reads, Religion that God our Father considers as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in distress and to keep oneself from being polluted from the world. I read that verse and you know, I was really convicted by that verse and I took it to heart and I took it quite literally and I said, God, give me the opportunity and so graciously he did. A few months ago, I had the privilege of going to Rehoboth Girls Orphanage in Thrift Shore um, and what an experience it was. I'm so happy to see Mummy or Miss Treasure here, um, as you may call her. Um, she is truly an amazing woman. She's the one that's been, as you know, running the orphanage there for the past 50 or so years. She's very humble, but you should know that what she does there is truly remarkable. I have the utmost respect and admiration for her because of that. Um, honestly, I can say it was one of the best experiences going to the orphanage. I. Uh, it wasn't easy, let me just say. I think for a girl from the States to go and be exposed to the heat and the lizards and the mosquitoes, it wasn't always comfortable. But it really gave me good insight into what a missionary's life would be like. The girls I met at the orphanage were, um, were wonderful. They were, you know, at first they're really shy and they won't come up to you and talk to you, but they'll look at you from a distance and they'll just smile at you. But if you are engaging and you go up and you talk to them, then slowly they start talking and they'll start telling you all their stories. And you know, after a few days, they really tell you so much of what they've been through and you should hear their stories. 
You know, I can't tell you how many times I would be talking to a seven or 13 year old girl and my eyes would well up with tears and you know, I'm holding back tears as I'm talking to them, just hearing their stories that they say in such a nonchalant sort of way. On one occasion, I was talking to a little girl um, and she was very excited, smart little girl, and she was just telling me about the things that she likes to do. So I was asking her what she likes, to, what the games she likes to play or the songs she likes to sing. Um, and then I asked her, you know, when is your birthday? Like, is it coming up soon? And, you know, at that point she kind of just looked at me and she smiled a little, but she didn't give me an answer. I thought maybe she hadn't understood the question because I was speaking English and she speaks mostly Malayalam. So again, I asked her and again, she didn't give me an answer. She just shrugged and looked at me. Another little girl was sitting a little bit off to the side and she spoke up and she said, she doesn't know when her birthday is. And I remember just thinking, who doesn't know when their birthday is? I mean, isn't that such a fundamental part of who we are? Like our name, our birthday, where we're from, isn't it? And I thought that a girl that was born who knows where and was brought to an orphanage, maybe at a couple days or a couple weeks after she was born, with no sense of who her family is or where she's from, that's a girl who may not know when her birthday is. And that just touched my heart. So I quickly just changed the subject and I asked her what her favorite subject in school was and she happily responded math and we continued talking like that. You know, during my time there, I just saw these girls, I saw how they longed to belong to someone, how they longed to share their day with someone and how they longed to have someone pray for them. On one occasion, I was out in the courtyard and um, a bunch of the ninth grade girls were in their uniforms and they were getting ready to go to their class and they came up to me and they said, Auntie, will you pray for us? And I said, of course, and so we, ha we formed a little circle, we held hands, and then I just committed them to the Lord in prayer. Um, this caught on, and after that, smaller groups of girls would come up to me and they'd be like, Auntie, can you pray for us? And so I would love to just listen to whatever's burdening their heart and just commit them to the Lord in prayer. You know, to this day, whenever I face difficulties or hard situations, whether it's an upcoming exam or presentation or a difficult situation at work, and I say this as a fully grown professional woman. One of the greatest comforts I have is when I know that my mom or dad will pray for me. And so to be able to pray for these little girls, whatever was burdening their heart, I think it meant more to me than it did to them, but I was just so happy to do that. Um, I know my time is getting short, but I just want to share one more story from Leha both. It was with an older girl that I had met there. She was my age, in fact, and she, um, she wasn't really close to a lot of the other girls there, but for some reason we bonded and we, got, we became very close. You know, she was telling me all the things that she had been through and how she was living with a lot of the repercussions of what had happened to her. We spent a great team of time talking and we were very, very close. One night she was walking me back to my room at night um, and it was dark and so we were arm in arm walking back to my room and she asked me, not in a way that was bitter or upset, but in a way that was genuinely hurt and confused, she asked, Auntie, why is God a partial God? And I looked at her and I said, I thought, like, what do you, what do you mean? Uh, why, why are you asking that? And she said, you are, you are from the United States, you are a doctor and you have two parents. Me, I am ugly. I live in an orphanage and I, have no, I don't even have one parent that loves me. Why does God do that? I looked at her and I said, you know, at first I, I didn't know what to say. I just held her hand. And then I looked at her and I said, you know, sometimes God allows things in our life that we don't understand. That God does, that allows things that we are not gonna understand, maybe even for a while. But we just have to have faith that he knows what he's, what, what is best for us in our life. And then I recall the passage from John chapter 9 about the man who was born blind and how when the disciples brought the man to Christ, they asked, Christ, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Christ replied, neither, but that this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. I told her that and I told her that you don't know the plans that God has for you, but rest assured that if you submit to God's leading in your life, he will, can do amazing things with your life. He can use you to touch the lives of these orphan girls in a way that a girl from America never could. You know, if you ever want to see an orphan girl's eyes filled with tears, tell
tell her that she has a purpose in this life and that it wasn't an accident. I thank God so much for the experience and um, it still brings me to tears even though it would happened a couple weeks, months ago. Um, it really opened my eyes to the different things. First, that leading a life in missions is not easy. Physically, it's uncomfortable. Spiritually, it's challenging. And emotionally, it's draining. But be sure of this. It's when you engage in missions that you have a first row seat to the amazing working hand of God. So to, to any of the girls sitting here, if you ever question the presence and authority of Christ, go on a missions trip. For those that can't go, I ask that you support, whether in prayer or financially, however it be, commit these workers into God's hands. Commit these little girls into God's hands. The second thing I was reminded of during this trip was just how blessed I really am. I humbly challenge all of us today, if after this conference you go home and you have a home to go to, know that you have been blessed. If you have the luxury of a bed at night, know that you have been blessed. If you have a church family that will pray for you, know that you have been blessed. If you have parents or kids or brothers or sisters that love you, you have been blessed. And as Luke 12, 48 reminds us, from everyone who has been given much, much more is expected. What can we do to show our love to a God who has done so much for us? I hope these words have been an encouragement. I apologize for the tears. May the name of the Lord be glorified. Presented by BrethrenNews.com.